Holy God, this is the time when we quiet our hearts and minds to really pay attention to what you have to say to us today. Fill us with your word and give us understanding by your Holy Spirit that having heard your word, we may live lives worthy of you. Amen. Hear now these words from Scripture. Our first reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus <coughs> and the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the gospel, that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learned from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ, on our behalf, and he has been made, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power so that you may have all endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 28. An expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You, O oh Lord, who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What must I do to inherit eternal life? 
asks the lawyer. What a question. Perhaps one we ask ourselves. Perhaps one we should ask ourselves. What do you think he means by eternal life? Everything I read is quick to interpret this as the kingdom of God. Jesus says in many, many places, wherever he or his disciples are sharing their message, that the kingdom of God has come near. So it does not seem to be a question about some future time or place something available in the here and now. At least, as Jesus presents it. Jesus responds with a question of his own. Remember now, this is not a society which observed separation of church and state. So the lawyer is an expert in religious law. Jesus could fully expect that one as educated as this lawyer would have an educated answer. The lawyer's response is a slight expansion on the beautiful Shema, which is recited by devout Jewish people twice a day, every day, to this day. Deuteronomy. <coughs> Verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. To love someone requires that you know that one. To know that one, we need to spend time with them, develop a relationship with them. So who is this God we are commanded to love with every fiber of our being? Who is this God? not really an easy question to answer, is it? Try. Who is God? Creator of the world. Creator of the world. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. <clears throat> the Almighty. The Almighty. So, how can we know God? Study His Word. Scripture. Very good. Prayer. Prayer. Loving our neighbors. By believing. Pardon? By believing. By believing. Being here. Being part of church. Fellowship. You can see God in nature. All of creation. Sometimes I think we get too caught up in seeing God as out there. And what I would like for us to do this morning is to really focus on God in us. I'd like us to explore that and see what it might do to help us live out this great commandment we're given this morning. Let's start in Scripture. 
And let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Take in a deep breath. Feel the air move through your nostrils and down into your lungs. Feel as it fills each cell of your body with the life-giving oxygen it needs. And breathe out thanksgiving for the miracle this truly is. Pay attention to your breathing. Enjoy it. Every breath you take is the very breath of God breathing life into you. This is how intimately God's Spirit is in and with us. Let's move on to Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me. For the Israelites, naming something or someone, gave them power over that being or object. Indeed, even today, when you hear something or someone's name, you form a picture in your mind that puts it in a box and limit who and what they may actually be. But God would not permit such a thing. The word God gave to Moses is a form of the Hebrew word to be. But it is a form that is both unpronounceable and defies precise interpretation. God's name is being itself. Let me say that again. God's name is being itself, yet more, always more. The Jewish people interpret the commandment, do not take the Lord's name in vain to mean not to speak it out loud at all. They replace the word, the name God gave to Moses, when it occurs in scripture with Lord. The name God gave to Moses is the word we pronounce as Yahweh. This is not accurate, but it is as close as we can come. Say the word. Say Yahweh. Yahweh. Notice that when you say the word, your lips never touch together. Your teeth never touch each other. Your tongue never touches the top of your mouth or your teeth. The word Yahweh is like breathing itself. So where does this take us in our quest to know and build a loving relationship with God? Every breath we take reminds us that we are filled and nourished 
by the breath of God. And God is being. God is life and more. God is always mystery. We cannot ever fully know God. Appreciating the gift of life and breath, experiencing life and breath as God's self expressed in our bodies and in everything that lives and supports life is a wonder filling us with awe and with love. Why is this loving relationship the most important thing we can do? Why wouldn't our relationships with people closest to us, our family, be the most important? I believe the command to love God is paramount because when we love God in this way, that love transforms us and thereby changes the way we love everything else, including our families. Our loving changes from a transaction where we love because of what that object of our love gives us or does for us, to loving them just because they are. Because they are truly wondrous gifts of God as well. Appreciating them as filled with God's gift of life and wanting to support them and help them to become all that they can be. To love God with all of our heart is to love with our innermost being. To love God with our soul is to love God with our true selves, not the image of ourselves that we create in our minds. To love God with our strength is to serve God with our energy, our physical strength, our resolve, and our resources. To love God with our mind is to put our intellectual faculties and our understanding at the service of God. Rather than letting our minds create who we think we are and what we need to do and be in the world. The result is that we place all of our attributes in loving service to God and we are no longer defined by them. No part of ourselves is withheld from God. To love our neighbor as ourselves becomes simply an outcome of loving God. We love ourselves in realizing that we are filled with God's Spirit and we are truly a wonder. We see our neighbor and all that is as another manifestation enlivened by the breath of God, another gift, another wonder to be treasured. No wonder Paul and Timothy, in our first reading this morning, are so filled with joy and thanksgiving that the church in Colossae is living out life lived in the light of God as Jesus has shown them through the teachings of his followers. And we are called to do 
do likewise. I would invite us to take some time this morning to ponder these things in our hearts. Sabbath, this time we set aside to contemplate our God together, is a time not to do, but to simply rest in the presence of God. Let us join together in a time of silent prayer. No words are needed. Just pay attention to your breathing, knowing this life-giving act is God's gift, not just to you, but to the world. Open your hearts and minds as we are guided by a line from one of the Psalms, and let us simply be together in the presence of God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know. Be still. Be. Thank you, Lord, for this time together with you. Thank you for the wondrous gift of life. Help us to glorify you by living this gift thankfully, joyfully, and lovingly. Amen.